everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Scapani, and I'm a features reporter at the Bangor Daily News. Uh, you may know me from my gardening writing and also Sam Tries Things, which is a video series I hosted for a while. Um, I'm really looking forward to speaking with Kate and Lacey tonight uh, to get you all, our gardeners, ready for spring. Uh, so for those of you in the audience, Stein Horror subscribers, thank you for your support. It uh, helps me keep my job, and I appreciate that. Uh, and welcome to all of you who may be joining in on our BDN events online meetups for the first time. Uh, if local journalism is important to you, please consider purchasing a subscription to <coughs> the Bangor Daily News. Uh, we would also like to thank our Tourmaline sponsor for this event, Har Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare. Uh, as a reminder, this event is being recorded. We will be taking questions from the audience towards the end of the discussion. So Kate and Lacey are going to present and then we're going to opening, open it up to questions uh, at the end after the presentations. Uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Kate or Lacey, please use the chat function, uh, which you can find on the bottom bar of your Zoom page. Uh, and I will ask the questions to them and moderate them on your behalf. Uh, so just a little introduction to both of our esteemed guests. Uh, Kate Garland is a horticultural specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. Kate works with school and community gardens to develop plans that will build sustainability and improve community impact of gardening spaces. And she answers a lot of my email questions when I am writing articles about gardening. Uh, Kate also coordinates the Master Gardener Volunteer Program uh, to train civic-minded gardeners uh, to help uh, with the community and ind individual garden support, it involves 50 hours of in-depth training in the art and science of horticulture, and in turn, the gardeners return their time uh, with volunteer educational or food security projects. Kate also is involved with the teen at Maine Harvest for Hunger, uh, who are volunteers growing, gleaning, and distributing thousands of pounds of food annually to shelters, pantries, and individuals struggling with food insecurity in and around Penobscot County. It's really great work. You should check it out. Miss Lacey Sinclair is the founder of Solid Roots, a gardening business that is now blossoming into a specialty cut flower farm in Hancock. Uh, Lacey grew up in Maine and has been farming professionally in Maine for 10 years. She designs and maintains gardens on Mount Desert Island and is now specializing in cutting gardens for her clients. Uh, the farm she's developing is a three acre farm where she grows seasonal flowers uh, and aims to create unique, sustainable and locally grown arrangements for weddings and flower lovers alike. Uh, you can follow her on Instagram and Facebook. Highly recommend. It's a fun follow uh, at Solid Roots Flower Farm, all one word. All right. So we're going to start with Kate's presentation and then get a few words from Lacey and then open it up for questions. So again, send your questions along to me in the chat and I will moderate them after the presentation. Kate. Thank you, Sam. I'm going to try to gracefully share my screen. Um, thank you for the great introduction and, and definitely doing an excellent job um, promoting the event. I'll, I'll forgive you, Sam, for um, doing such a great job because I got all these texts and, and emails from family and friends and my face circled in the newspaper. So <laughs> it was a reflection of how great a job you guys do. So, um, and Lacey, I'm super excited to present with you as well. And um, the format we, we decided ahead of time was to, for each of us to kind of um, offer about 15 minutes of a quick lightning round, um, tidbits of information. And then um, we're gonna have you guys ask a lot of questions which you've already been doing a great job of um, over, the, over the email. And so I'm gonna use my 15 minutes to talk about resources um, because there's only so much we can talk about in an hour. Um, and I want you to know where to go when you have further questions along the way. And you're gonna have a lot of questions if you get into gardening, because it's a, a very humbling um, hobby for sure. And then offer some timely tips of what I'm doing in the garden. Um, so with that, um, uh, the Cooperative Extension has a lot of fantastic um, resources. I'm a little bit biased, but I'm really proud of the work that we're doing. Um, especially in relation to COVID and having to pivot like all of all different organizations and individuals out there um, last year did. And what we did instead of um, doing our in-person programming when we had to close up, 
um, we transitioned very quickly to developing a lot of online content to, to um, enhance what we already had for online content. So here is a list of a lot of um, different things. It's a mix of new content and, and existing content. The Victory Garden series is a uh, vegetable gardening short course that's self-paced and free. Um, I highly recommend that. And links to these are actually gonna be shared with you in the chat and in a follow-up email as well. So as we go along, um, you can click on any of those as they pop up. But yeah, the Victory Garden series is 10 parts that um, are about 10 to 15 minutes long. And you can hop on whenever you want and just watch a segment such as how to plan your garden or how to prepare your garden soil um, or even how to put your garden to bed. So lots of great information in those series um, that I highly encourage you to check out. The Main Home Garden Newsletter is a resource that's been around for quite a long time. It's a statewide garden newsletter that offers timely tips on gardening in Maine. So each newsletter has a, you know, May is the month too, for example, and it's a, a list of things that you should be thinking about doing in your landscape. And then each um, issue has information on a more in-depth article. For example, last month we had one on growing sweet potatoes in Maine. Um, and they're all from Maine authors for the most part. I can't think of any recent ones that haven't been from Maine authors, but um, from either extension staff or master gardener volunteers that um, have experienced gardening in our region. And it's all research-based unbiased information. So no one's trying to sell you anything. Um, and it's it's really, um, I can't, I can't be prouder of, of the work that is being done in that newsletter. And, and it's also, there's some fun things too. So we do book reviews and we just added a, um, a reader exchange where folks can share, you know, gardening hacks. There's a great um, soil sifter tumbler in our, in our most recent gardening uh, gardener exchange. So um, definitely check out the main home garden newsletter. It's free. It comes out monthly. Um, webinars, we have a number of great webinars coming up. For example, tomorrow we have one on fiddleheads and we happen to have two that are back to back um, a couple weeks apart, but those are gonna be focused on managing weeds, which isn't the sexiest of topics, but it is an essential topic. And um, I, I can assure you that you will pick up some great tips that you will um, be thankful for when August rolls around or July rolls around when we typically are chest high in weeds in an unmanaged garden. So um, please plan ahead for managing weeds and, and consider um, attending one of those webinars. But again, Fiddleheads is tomorrow and that's gonna be a really popular one. And it's still, it's not too late to register for that. But we'll add more webinars as this season goes along. I know there's one on irrigation, for example, that's already lined up. Um, so those will be linked in the chat. We all also have countless videos and bulletins um, such as how to prune your blueberries, for example, or um, strawberries, strawberry varieties for Maine, um, how to uh, purchase soil for your raised beds even. That was a new bulletin that came up. And one that just popped up um, today, fresh off the press, is one on um, purchasing, uh, hosting plant sales and attending plant sales and what you should be looking at for um, as a, a, someone who might be stopping at your local plant sale as far as invasive species and how to minimize um, your negative impact on the environment by looking out for those invasive species and including insect species. So there's some great, great information there. Um, the Diagnostic Lab and, and Tick Lab, hopefully all of you are aware of the, these resources already, but in case you're not, um, that those are both great resources. It's actually under the same roof, but um, the diagnostic lab is a great resource for folks, folks that happen to notice insect problems or disease problems in their plants over the growing season. You can take pictures or send in samples. We like to start with pictures because a lot of times we can identify problems over email with pictures. Um, but if we can't, you can send in a sample to the lab and we'll help you understand what might be causing a problem in your garden so you can take the most effective management strategies or steps to, to um, mitigate the problem. The tick lab, unfortunately, is more and more needed every day. Uh, I personally found a tick on me last weekend. So they are out there and they are very important to 
look out for right now um, and all pretty much all season long, all year long. And so if um, you happen to find a tick, don't throw it away, keep it, send it into the tick lab for identification. You can actually get it identified for free, but if you wanted to pay $15, um, you can also um, get it tested for pathogens as well, which is, gives you a good peace of mind as to what, what your risk might be for, for some of the pathogens that uh, ticks carry. And then we have a great social media presence as well. So if you search Humane Cooperative Extension on Facebook, and I believe we have Instagram, I'm not super savvy with Instagram, Lacey's the Instagram person here. Um, I believe we have an Instagram account as well. So that's, those are your resources and where to go when you have um, questions down the line. And then um, I'm gonna do a quick lightning round of some of the things that I'm doing in the garden right now. And um, Sam, I'm gonna lean on you to just kind of give me a hand raise when I have like, when I'm getting close to my 15 minute mark, which I might already be, but <laughs> okay, cool. So I'm starting seeds indoors. Uh, I'm testing soil and I'm managing brown tail moth. I'm, um, well, last year at this time, I'm preparing straw bale gardens. I'm not, truth be told, doing it right now. Um, and I'm also trying to be patient. So I'm gonna talk about each one of these and stuff at each slide. Um, the first one is starting seeds. And I just wanted to share, hopefully I can um, share this. I may have to reshare this actually real quick because I didn't optimize sound. actually. Can you see it still, Sam? I'm going to actually, looking at the time, I'm going to skip showing the full video, but talk about starting seeds indoors and timing, um, because timing is so important. One of the things that people that are new to starting seeds indoors do um, is start seeds way too early. And um, if we have time later on, I'll show a video on how we make newspaper pots and maybe I can actually share a link to that um, later in the email too. Um, and I use newspaper pots for starting tomato seedlings indoors. And I even use those sleeves that the newspapers come in to make a mini greenhouse around the tomato seedlings. Um, but now is a great time to start your tomato seedlings. A lot of folks feel like the windows closed on a lot of that, but I just started our tomatoes, um, peppers, marigolds, um, Celosia, there's, there's still a lot that needs to be planted um, probably two weeks from now too, like any of your vining crops like pumpkins and melons, squash, those things can be started in early May. And you can even start broccoli and um, cauliflower and kale in mid to late May for a late season crop. So um, don't feel like you've missed the boat on starting seeds indoors. A number of crops um, it is a little bit late, but a lot of our traditional vegetable crops, you can start seeds indoors. Um, so the next thing that I'm doing is, oops, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> Here we go. If I can make it go forward. There we go. Is I'm soil testing. So um, we have a big demonstration garden um, at Old Town, um, Rogers Farm demonstration garden. And I just put in eight soil tests so that I could figure out what we needed to add for fertilizers and um, whether I needed to adjust the pH going into this um, growing season. And it is so important to take that step to test your soil before adding in those fertilizers and any other soil amendments so you know what you're working with in the first place and not just blindly guessing um, going in. A lot of folks are you know, go into the gardening season and, and want to know what fertilizer do I need to add, um, but it depends. It depends on what is, is happening, happening chemically in your soil um, in the first place. So um, I would definitely discourage folks um, to, from adding lime every year, for example, because you can increase your pH over a period of time and have that be just as bad as having a low pH garden. Um, and same with adding nutrients. You don't wanna add too many nutrients to your system more than your plants need. So a lot of gardeners find that they save a lot of money in the long run um, when they do soil testing every three to four years. 
And what I always like to remind folks um, when you do a soil test through the Maine Soil Testing Service, that the, the report that you get back, which gives you information um, for a standard soil test on lead content, it gives you information on how, what your pH is, your organic matter and nutrient levels. Um, that report is only as good as the sample that you bring in. So um, for example, here, if this garden has had mixed vegetables in it for years and years um, and has been treated about the same and the soil, test, uh, soil type seems to be about the same, then I would do a, a sample for this entire area and I would take about 10 to 12 samples, um, about six to eight inches deep from a variety of spots. That might be overkill, maybe more like eight to 10. Um, and mix them in a bucket or a plastic bag or grocery bag of some sort, just so you're getting a mixture from this whole area versus oh, I've got to do a soil test. I'm going to go out and grab one scoop and fill the box and call it good. Um, you want to get, get a snapshot that's representative of the whole area. Um, so take your time with it, but it's really surprisingly easy and extremely informative. So. I was out clipping winter moth, uh, uh, brown tail moth webs out of our trees around our native plant arboretum that surrounds our office in Bangor yesterday. And that, this is the first year I've had to do that. So um, brown tail moth is a reality in our area. And um, the window is very quickly closing on when it's um, pretty safe to, and safe is a, a relative term, um, to go out and, um, and prune those out of your trees. Pretty soon those caterpillars with the hairs are gonna start um, emerging and those hairs are gonna only um, develop more and more um, aerotints as they get bigger. So your exposure, the issue here is that for human health is that um, they cause a itch um, and skin irritation. So if, if folks are exposed. So you wanna try to look out for those. They have very distinctive um, webs right now. They look like they're um, silver leaves on the tips of apple trees and anything in that same family, the rose family um, and oak trees as well. You're, you'll notice them. Unfortunately, there's a really um, a couple of good examples in front of the UMA uh, Bangor campus sign or behind it, I should say. There's a couple of crab apples that are loaded with it. So if you wanna see what that looks like, you can drive by there. Um, so again, this is a good time to be doing that. Wear gloves and um, when you prune them out, put them in a bucket of soapy water and leave those in a bucket of soapy water for about five days pour that out in a safe place where you're not gonna be exposed to that water and then put them in a trash bag. If you immediately put them in a trash bag, they hatch, they will eat through plastic. Learn the hard way. <laughs> so um, the next picture here is a straw bale garden that we actually brought to the Bangor State Fair a few um, years ago. And um, it's just a fun, simple way of um, establishing a, a small space garden if you don't have construction materials or construction supplies. Um, and you wanna go a little bit bigger than a container garden. So you can um, start by prepping a bale for about two weeks before the planting season. So again, this is a good time to start that process. You um, prep it by watering it every day um, for that two week period. And about a week into it, you start adding um, nitrogen to that straw bale and then um, it'll start breaking down and you can plant directly into it uh, when the time is right for the crops that you're growing. So, and there's um, some good information that is coming your way in a, um, in a bulletin that will be shared later on. And then the other piece is be patient. So I'm talking with a lot of folks that are new to an area like new to Maine or have moved to a new landscape even within the same community. And um, over the years, I've heard of many um, sad stories of people unintentionally cleaning something out that was a very good plant, um, or they're establishing a garden an area where there may have been some plants that were keepable and they unintentionally dug them up. So I suggest if you're new to a landscape, watching that landscape for an entire season, stepping away from you know pruners, shears, loppers, and um, just seeing what's there before you make any major changes. And another reason um, to be patient is um, don't 
plant too early. Now, some things can be planted now and we can get to that with the, the Q&A session, but um, a lot of things can get um, set back significantly if it's too planted too early. And I would say most of your warm season crops, things like um, most of your flowering annuals and your tomatoes and peppers, you'll want to plant in very end of May, early June. Um, some of your direct seeded ones can be planted sooner, but there's some great resources on that as well. But they're really, it doesn't benefit you in a huge way to plant earlier and you can get set back quite a ways um, if you do that. It can be very disappointing. I think of last year when we had the frost um, at the end of May and it was pretty heartbreaking for a lot of gardeners. So with that, I will share the floor with Lacey and um, look forward to answering your questions. Okay. Um, hi guys. Um, so I want to talk real quickly kind of about what's going on on our farm um, and then kind of give you guys some instruction for things that you can do, things that we're doing. Um, so we have sat on our property for a year, um, kind of let everything do what it was going to do, see what was going to happen. Um, oh, no. And now we're kind of ready to get rolling on it. Um, so we've had our field tilled last fall. Um, we had to till it because we had a lot of native spirea that wasn't going to go away without tilling. But overall, we're actually going to be using a no-till method here. Um, I've learned a lot about this from Charles Dowding. He has a wonderful YouTube channel about no-dig gardening, and he's a really sweet older gentleman. Um, I just love listening to him talk. But um, so we're, we are just adding compost on top of our tilled soil and we are going to be planting directly into that, um, broad forking it in, adding the amendments that our soil test tells us that we need to, um, and then working with that soil. Um, because we're going to be farming on a large scale, we're using landscape fabric to cover our, our rows with. Um, this just keeps down on weeding. But um, otherwise, all of our methods would kind of be the same. So because I'm in the world of professional flower farming and growing, um, I'm going to do things a little bit scary. <laughs> um, or I'm just going to try things. You know, I want to make sure that I can get flowers out as soon as I can. Um, so we do direct sow uh, a lot of cold hardy annuals. And we um, have already started a lot of those types of things too, that we're already hardening off to try and try and plant outside. But something that I do that really helps my plants, I think, is I'm kind of tough on them. Um, you know, everyone wants this like 80 degree greenhouse with like no wind and excellent humidity. And I know that that's not the real world for my plants. So I am running a fan on those guys really hard. I'm opening the windows often. Um, I might kind of, you know, the things that are ready for it, I'm going to start introducing them to the sun every once in a while. I might just take a tray out and sit outside for half an hour and just let it breathe a little bit. Um, but yeah, so I also don't want to take up too much of everyone's time. So I'm going to open this presentation um, and kind of go through these things quickly. But overall, um, a lot of what I've done in gardening is not just growing things, but finding a way to use everything that I grow. So there's so many flowers that you can use to make dyes, you can dry them, you can craft with them, arrange with them. Um, cook with them. So I'm going to kind of touch on those things just in case it's not something that you've done before or it's something that you want to try. Um, so let's see, share screen and we're going to click this one and present. Okay. So, um, flowers that you guys can direct. So now I'm in 5B. So I am on the coast of Maine. I can see the water out my window. I am going to be a little bit different than, you know, if you live in Carabasset Valley or Fort Kent. Um, so just a general guide of stuff that um, has a colder hardiness temperature and can take a little bit of stress. Um, like Kate said, you're not getting ahead a ton by doing this. My plants are going to be growing, but they're not going to get huge. They're not going to be blooming in May. 
Um, but it's just getting them established, getting them used to the outside environment so that they have a really healthy life cycle ahead of them. Um, let's see, oops. Okay, so love and a mist, Nigella. Um, I've included pictures. Um, most of these are our pictures, but I do wanna just let you guys know that towards the end, I'm sharing some that are from seed websites. Um, but Nigella is such a cool flower. Um, it comes in mostly blues, whites, pinks, and purples. And you can really put it in the ground by seed any time of year. Um, when the flowers are done, they create these little seed pods that are super easy to save. There's a ton of seeds in them. Um, they're also beautiful to arrange with. They're also quick to bloom. I think that their maturity is like 65 days. So you're looking at like two months. So these will most likely be blooming um, by early summer. And let's see, click again. Um, can't talk about spring flowers without talking about sweet peas. We have already direct seeded some of these. Um, in our field. Um, they're great because they're fragrant. Um, they're also vining. So if you are gonna plant them, you want them going up a fence or on a lattice um, or on pea brush. If you have like young birch, you can use that. Um, there's a ton of color variants and variegation in sweet peas, warm and cool colors, which is kind of unusual. Um, so you might find blues, you might find reds and pinks. Um, the seeds are toxic, so that is really important to know. But this is another plant that like, you just can save the seeds forever. And the seeds that you guys save, if you've been growing your plants in Maine, are, are going to have a little bit of a genetic you know, they're, they're going to be used to this environment. So those seeds are better off than seeds that you might get from California. Um, red seed poppies. Um, I know that a couple people asked about, um, bee friendly plants. This is definitely one of them. Um, bees absolutely love these things. They're, they love to just crawl into these ruffled petals, but if you also have the single bloomers, they'll just be rolling around inside them. They're beautiful. The flowers actually don't last um, in a vase at all, <laughs> uh, but the pods that they create are gorgeous. They're an excellent texture to have in the garden and to bring inside. Um, it's kind of like a little drumstick and when the seeds are ready, you can kind of shake it and hear them inside. Um, again, seeds forever. Like you plant one pod's worth of these and you will never buy poppy seeds again. But there are so many varieties out there that I encourage you to keep looking into them and keep getting more. Um, so some other stuff that you can plant now, again, it's going to depend on what part of Maine you're in. Um, Lupin, Buplorum, Bachelor's Buttons, Stock, Bells of Ireland, Dianthus, Bee Balm. I'm referring to the Monarda Lombok Lombata, which is an annual bee bomb, but perennials are also fair game right now. Um, Crest, Euphorbia, Queen Anne's Lace, Crest again, Calendula, um, Strawflower, Pansies, and Viola. These are the two, like these guys right now are on point. They can take lots of, lots of frost. Um, and then more of your poppies and Orlia. Um, so something else that I am really into, we grow edible flowers for restaurants in our area because we're in the Bar Harbor Ellsworth area um, and we just have the right kind of clientele for it. So this is a great thing um, to kind of add to your veggie garden if you have a little extra space. Um, so some of my favorites, um, oh, just kidding, what to do with your edible flowers. Um, so garnishing your dishes, is probably their most common use, topping them on salads. Um, they are beautiful on cakes. You can put any flour on a cake, but it's a lot safer it's some, if it's something that someone can eat by accident. Um, they're also really fun to freeze into ice cubes and you can use those to make your beverages a nice mocktail or cocktail. Um, oils, vinaigrettes, and jams are also another way to get these guys out. Uh, as far as cleaning them, I usually throw them in a strainer and then dunk that strainer in some cold, cold water. Um, and I, I'm always shaking bugs off as I pick them. Um, but yeah, and then just store them in a Tupperware container and you can usually get a, up to a week out of them. Um, let's see. And then I think this is my favorite edible flower. So borage, um, 
Borage comes in white and blues generally. It's, it blends really well into the vegetable garden because it has that fuzzy texture like your squash and cucumber plants do. Um, but it's a major hot spot for the bees. So this is one of those plants that if you guys are keeping bees, this is something that I would really encourage you to grow. Um, it also self sows which is something that you can tell I probably <laughs> love. Um, they tend to just kind of pop up in your herb or veggie garden for years to come after that first initial planting. Um, so you get so much more value out of something like that that just keeps returning to your garden. Um, pansies and violas, these are at your garden centers now. By the way, guys, if you're not sure if it's okay to plant something, go to your garden center. They will not have things outside that can't go in the ground where you live. Um, and they'll know like if it's time or not yet. Um, so pansies and violas can bloom all summer if you keep deadheading the flowers. So producing seed is gonna take a lot of energy out of them. So keep them from doing that. Keep deadheading the flowers. And if they're in a shady enough spot, if they're, it's a little cooler, they will keep blooming. Um, there's so much color and variation in pansies and violas. Um, violas also have a little bit of a sweet smell, which is very endearing. Um, and they're generally pest free. Um, you can also use the entire flower or you can pull individual petals off and use those. Um, and then let's see, nasturtiums. Um, you can't miss nasturtiums because they're, they're just so different than a lot of edible flowers. They have a kind of spicy flavor, sort of like arugula. Um, the leaves and the flowers are edible. And the leaves start out small and then get bigger. So you have a lot of variety that you can use. When the leaves are bigger, I like to slice them up and put them in salads. When they're smaller, they make a beautiful little garnish. The leaves always look so good. Um, and then the flowers, this is one you want to check for bugs. Um, little bugs love to crawl in those things, but because they have that nice kind of trumpet hole, they're also great for pollinators. Hummingbirds love them. Um, they're usually in warm colors. So your yellows, peach, um, reds, oranges, um, and they're going to be mounding or vining. So you want to pay attention to the variety you're getting. If it has, if you're only seeing height and the height is like five or six feet, then that means it's a vining variety and it needs something to climb up or it's going to crawl out of your garden, um, which is also a cool effect. Um, so some other edible flowers, uh, feverfew, chamomile, scarlet rudder beans are a really cool one. Um, those are also super easy to save seed of. They make a really pretty purple seed with like little purple spots on it that are, they're huge. Um, and it's just a gorgeous color flower. Uh, marigolds, sunflowers, every part of a sunflower plant is edible, leaves, roots, everything, um, which I think is really cool. Um, and then dill calendula and bachelor's buttons. Um, and then I did want to touch a little bit on like ornamentals that you can add to your garden that I think are just like some of the best for cutting um, and also really hardy. So if you're a beginner or if you're, if you're a little less capable and you don't have like super healthy soil and you're not sure how much you can really do with it, these are going to be some good ones for you. Um, so peonies, of course, um, peonies seem to intimidate a lot of people. Um, I think it's because they have that sort of elegance to them. They just seem kind of out of touch, but they grow everywhere and they love poor soil. They've got a tap root. So they've got a lot of mileage to kind of get all the nutrients they need from the depth of the soil that they reach. Um, they bloom for a nice long time. The month of June is peony month here in Maine. Great fragrance um, and also a great vase life. So there's been a lot of um, experimentation with peonies and getting them to last a really long time. And something that I'm hoping to try this year is picking them at the marshmallow stage, which is gonna be this bloom that's kind of on the bottom here that looks a little bit puffy. So it's starting to bring its color out and you can, you, you'll feel a little bit of those tender petals in there. Um, and then wrapping those up and putting them in your fridge and supposedly they last for like three or four weeks. And this is what they do in the floral industry. If you want 
peonies at a really odd time, you're getting ones that have been in a cooler for months. Um, so it's su such a cool thing. And, and if you do pick them and you pick them at the marshmallow stage, they're going to be in a vase for like two weeks and your house is going to smell amazing. Um, the one thing about them is that they do require staking. However, if you're picking them at marshmallow stage, you might actually miss that point when the blooms get too heavy to be supported by the plant. Um, so sometimes using the stuff like that is, is that advantage to kind of take a little bit of work out of it for you. Um, peonies do attract ants. Don't try to keep the, the ants away from your peonies. They actually do need them. Um, they help open up the blooms. Um, this is one of the first shrubs that you see at your garden centers in the spring is Pieris japonica, um, andromeda. They are slow to establish. So the shrubs in this picture are about my height, six feet, but they are, I'd say seven to 10 years old. Um, so they, they're slow to establish, but they're an evergreen and they're practically ever blooming because after they bloom, they make these gorgeous seeds that just hang out all winter. Um, so in the, in the spring, they're already like putting on a show. Um, people are always asking me when I plant things in their gardens, like, well, what does it look like in the winter? And this is, this is the one, if that's, if you want something that looks good in the winter, if you have a real high access point, like your front door, put a nice shrub next to your front door. That's going to last all winter. Um, it kind of it just adds so much to a garden to have some evergreens in there. Um, can't go without mentioning lilacs. Um, lilacs, I've done a lot with these last few years. Um, I used the petals to make a lilac cordial, which was like a sort of like a simple syrup with lilac in it. And it was so delicious. Um, I could drink it with just soda water. Um, we've also uh, harvested them to put in beer that we uh, sold at Orno Brewing Company. Um, so they are really multi-purpose, um, but if you're cutting them, they're kind of, they're not as, they don't last a long time in a vase. So um, they've got, they've just got so much going on and they've got thick stems. So if you have really thick stems, something that you can do to help a plant take up water is to cut up into the stem or to scrape away some of the bark from the outside, gives it a little bit more surface area. I also recommend removing all the leaves and keeping just one bud on each stem. Um, and I like to cut them when just about a third and it's usually like the bottom third of the flowers have stopped, started to open. Um, but lilacs are absolutely worth bringing in your house because that smell will stick around for weeks. Um, and Baptisia, um, a lot of people know this is false indigo. It's generally blue, hence the indigo. Um, but there are some really neat yellows and like chocolatey reds. Um, I love this plant because you can use it all year round and it regrows. So kind of to the ground in the spring, if you wanted to use that much of it and it would, it would come back up. Um, so the, the foliage, the seed pods and the flowers are all beautiful to work with. And it looks good in the garden year round. It doesn't generally have any pest issues. It might need staking when they get older. I know a lot of people aren't capable of dividing these plants because again, they have that tap root, which makes them great because they love awful soil, which we have a lot of here in Maine, but that makes them really hard to divide because it's just this enormous web. Um, but they, if you can divide them, these plants grow so fast. You can divide them almost every other year and just keep sharing. And that's a good way to kind of keep something like that manageable and under control. Um, and then Aquilegia, this is the only native, I think, on my list um, as far as my pictures go. Um, I believe that this variety, in case someone asks, is a Barlow. Um, it does self seed, which is really fun. Um, these are, do tend to get um, a leaf miner if they've been the same place for a long time. So I know in the cut flower world, we kind of treat them as an annual, um, but you can have them in your garden for a long time and they will just keep coming back. Um, there's so many different sizes of blooms. There's a lot of the nodding heads and then there's some that kind of come up right and have big star shaped flowers. Um, a really cool one to add to the garden. 
Um, and then, so a couple of things that we're excited about, if you are an experienced gardener, um, I do believe most of these seeds are sold out. I'm sorry, um, I picked them before that happened, but um, this is stuff that we're growing for 2021. Um, I bought these from companies that sell smaller amounts. Um, so Baker's Creek, which is rareseeds.com, they always have interesting varieties. They're usually a little more, um, in the vegetable world, but they're really starting to come into cut flowers as well. Um, and then Florette is another um, source that I bought seeds from. I personally haven't had great luck with their germination. So I, I pay a lot of attention to these seeds and that's just kind of something um, you have to experiment with. So bunny ears violas. I just thought these were the cutest thing in the world. Um, I love flowers that have that kind of Alice in Wonderland sort of vibe to them. So these would be a great little fairy garden addition. Um, brush strokes violas. I don't see a lot of variegation in violas. So I thought these were really cool um, with that deep red coming in. And I loved the variation of like light yellows to reds. Um, Nicotiana, not a great cut flower because it's sticky and it's messy. Um, but if you do use it, it's super unique. Um, it's usually only yellow, green, and white. So to see a peach was really fun for me. Um, and these bloom forever. Pollinators love them because they have that trumpet shaped, um, flower. So it's great for hummingbirds. And then I think this is my last one. Um, sweet pea azurus. Um, this to me is like if cineglossum and sweet peas had a baby, this is what it would look like. Um, they look a little daintier than your usual sweet peas. And again, I did get these seeds for, from Florette. So we're going to, um, kind of baby them a little bit and make sure that they're going to work good, uh, before we plant them out. Um, but I thought that this was a really great one to try. Um, and I believe that is the end of my, um, there you go. Um, so yeah, uh, I just wanted to, um, also go back into like the fertilizing note that Kate had said, um, because I know a lot of people are asking about what fertilizers to put into your garden. Yes, you should do a soil test. Um, but I also think that something that a lot of people don't do is they just rely on that fertilizer and they're not adding organic material to their garden. You really should be putting compost in your garden every year. Um, think of fertilizer as like a multivitamin. Like if you're not feeding yourself well and you're not healthy, your body's not going to do anything with that multivitamin. Um, so, you know, unless your soil biology is there, your plants might not be able to use all that expensive fertilizer that you're pouring on them. Um, and compost can be really easy to make on your own. Um, it's not that expensive to buy large quantities of. A lot of people are used to just buying bags of compost, but if you reach out to a landscape company, it's not that expensive to have someone come and bring a yard of dirt to your house and it is so worth it. Um, right now we've got some, what we're using right now is I think it's a mixture of um, stuff from the horse track in Bangor and some of the goat poo from Lemoyne that we had left over. So a nice mix of things um, and kind of mix it up year after year. Don't always be doing the same thing. Um, you know, just think of it as a buffet for your plants, give them a little bit of variety. Um, but yeah, Sam, I'll send it back to you so we don't run me too long here. Awesome. All right. So now we're going to move on to the Q&A portion. Thank you to everyone who has sent in questions so far. Kate, I'm going to ask you to unmute and you too as well, Lacey, because um, we're going to start this with a lightning round of a few questions that I think you guys can answer fairly quickly. Okay. Uh, Lacey, do you sell seeds at your farm? I do not sell seeds. Um, the majority of my seeds I purchase from Geo Seeds and Johnny's Seeds. And then, like I said, we use Rare Seeds and um, which is Baker Creek and um, a little bit of Florette for some really specialty varieties that we want. Kate, where else do you buy seeds? Uh, we're not allowed to promote any um, specific company, just not out there, but um, Maine has an incredible um, resource with um, a number of different seeds. So we've got um, Johnny's selected seeds, Fedco, um, 
uh, Maine Potato Company does the, a, a variety of plant materials. So they're a Maine based company. So I would start with there, but um, I will say that Baker Creek has a absolutely stunning catalog. It's like one of those eye candy things. And um, as far as catalogs go, Fedco has a lot to be proud of as well. There's a lot yeah. of good humor in there too. So <laughs> how frequently should you test your soil? You want me to take that one? Or sure. <laughs> I'd say every three to four years, unless you're starting to see signs of nutrient deficiencies or issues, then um, you might want to do it more frequently than that. But usually three to four years is sufficient. Do you turn your soil before you gather samples for your soil tests? Not for if you've got an active vegetable garden or raised bed or if act, an area where you're actively planting, um, just test it um, like you'd be planting a, a tomato transplant. Just dig right in, top six to eight inches deep. And with your soil, if you're testing your lawn, you're going to want to do the same um, depth, maybe a little bit deeper, um, and make sure you take off any tightly bound. Um, plant material off the top before you put it in the soil box. And for both of you, uh, how do you keep deer out of your garden? You do it in sync? <laughs> <laughs> it's a fence. It's a fence, guys. Um, I just want to say, I think almost everything that I kind of showed you guys pictures of are deer proof or deer resistant plants. Um, toxic plants are deer proof because they're toxic. Um, but you could plant an entire fence of toxic plants and the deer will just walk through it. So it has to be a fence. Um, here on the farm, we are doing a, an eight foot fence, but we're running six feet of deer fencing. And then we're running a trip line, a kind of a wire up at the top that will have flags on it with some cedar posts to kind of keep the deer completely out of ours. Cause they have a good, we're in a good field so they could get a running start, but a deer without a running start can jump eight feet. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, it's a huge challenge. I mean, there are deterrents out there and there's some, some level of efficacy, but they're, they're biological organisms that need to eat. And if they are hungry, they will do surprising things and eat surprising things too. I've seen them eat barberry and Bricosa rose and all sorts of interesting things that you would never think um, they would eat. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, they have, they seem to have a taste for thorns. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you're growing low growing crops, this is such a common thing that I'm gonna spend a second, second more um, low growing crops um, is just like a little, little hoop with row cover over it can be a nice simple strategy. So if, if you've got row, um, a raised bed and you're growing um, lettuce or spinach for any of the critters, so woodchucks and bunnies and turkeys, those are all things that would eat those things. You can just create a barrier by putting a wire hoop and then row cover over that. And those are examples of things that don't need pollinators to get into access the plant. So you can grow them all season long under that row cover or also known as Agrabon. Awesome. All right, now we're gonna get into some of the more in-depth questions that we've received via chat and email. Um, like you said, Lacey, we've gotten a lot of questions about fertilizer. So my question to both of you uh, is, how do you go about choosing the correct or best fertilizer for your garden? And we've had some specific questions about uh, gladiolas uh, and uh, 5 10, 10 fertilizer that uh, should be addressed. Yeah. Um, with gladioles and dahlias, bulbs generally, because their life cycle lives in just basically a seed, are phosphorus heavy. So there's products by Epsoma like Bulb Tone that have a high phosphorus number and they're going to do that job for you. But it, it does still depend on your, on your soil test, whether or not you even need these things. I wouldn't just put something in there not knowing if I needed it because you can run into a lot of problems, especially with things like nitrogen. Yeah, I think I couldn't, I couldn't add much more to that. I mean, it really, um, the nice thing about that soil test report is it will break it down as to how much you will need to add per thousand square feet and um, all your local extension offices receive the county, um, uh, the reports for your entire county. So we can look up your report and talk it through with you and help you develop a shopping list so that you can get the right fertilizers to target your specific, your soil specific needs. And just for anyone who might be overwhelmed by the numbers, things like 5, 10, 10, those just represent ratios of different, of different chemicals, right? 
Yeah, so it's um, the ratio of N N NPK, <laughs> nitrogen, potassium, um, and potash. So, um, or nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. And so if you've got um, a hundred pound bag uh, of, N of five, 10, 15, that means that you've got the equivalent of five pounds of nitrogen, 10 pounds of phosphorus, and 15 pounds of potash. So it's just the relative weight of those mm. particular ingredients. And the rest of it's in there, it's usually a, a carrier that's um, used to build that. Um, so it's easy to spread. Uh, how do you go about reusing soil in raised beds? And what are some things you have to keep in mind when it comes to uh, planting and uh, crop rotation and things like that? Do you, do you want to take it or do you want me to? I, I yeah, I mean, so to give you guys an example, um, we have a lot of customers that have raised veggie gardens and we just add compost to those beds every year. Um, I like to leave a lot of the roots behind to kind of break down. So I'm not taking everything out of the soil. Uh, but if there's stuff in the way, I might kind of sift through things and pull out any, any big leftovers. Um, but generally we just add compost and the necessarily fertilizers on top of that, um, give it a little break in and plant right away. I like Lacey's um, practical explanation of kind of basically no-till gardening, um, which is what we want more gardeners to go towards. Um, when you till, you're, um, you're breaking down the soil structure, but um, weed management wise, it's really important to not till because your soil, unfortunately, it has this deep history of all these weed seeds raining down on it. And there's a, a huge bank of seeds in your soil, unfortunately. Some soils have more weed seeds than others, but when you till, you're bringing up that older seed that's resting, that can stay resting for 30 to 40 years. Um, and get that flash of light, get that right germination conditions, and then boom, they're a problem in your garden. So yet yeah, another reason to not till and add organic matter and, um, and add fertilizer as needed, but I, the only thing I would add to that too is um, adding cover crops to your soil is yeah. a good practice. So um, for example, if you've got a bed of tomatoes, um, a raised bed four by eight of uh, maybe four or five tomato plants, um, around the beginning of August, you might wanna under sow those tomatoes while they're still growing with some oats. And then those oats will cover the soil and start building more organic matter back into the soil. And then at the end of the season, when your tomato plants are done, you can cut them off at the soil line with a pair of loppers like Lacey does, leave the roots right behind, let them break down in the soil, let those oats keep growing up. Those will get cut, um, uh, uh, hit by the frost and they will actually winter kill, which is what I like to have our, our cover crops do. And then you can, plant directly in that garden, another family of plants. So for example, you, put, you have tomatoes in there this year, you could do um, beans in there next year. And that's a, a different plant family. I think I shared a link with um, the BDN organizers about um, a good resource on rotating based on plant families. Um, and so having that bed in beans is a, gonna reduce your um, pest pressure um, and actually add nitrogen back into the soil as well. And you don't have to even turn over those oats because they're all dead. They're gonna create a living mulch and you just poke holes where you want the beans to go and call it good. Awesome. We have uh, one event attendee who is uh, <laughs> doing elevated garden beds that are about 30 inches high. Uh, any additional tips on plants that work particularly well for garden beds of, of this size? My back is jealous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't think of anything that would behave differently in that setting. Um, yeah, I guess I think depending on where you are, your that bed may get a little colder, a little faster, may stay, may warm up a little quicker, depending on what you're doing with it. Um, but you, that's kind of just something you'd have to keep an eye on. And if it were one or the other, then I would recommend, you know, some warmer loving vegetables like peppers and tomatoes or cooler things like kale and chard. And if it's a shallow bed, 
it's going to demand more water too. Um, so that's another thing to consider. Uh, another raised bed question. What are some uh, vegetables that can be planted now that are uh, good for first time gardeners that are not super fussy and will grow well in a raised bed? Great question. I mean, there's a lot that you can um, sow right now. Um, peas, I would say, would be my number one thing. Um, lettuce, spinach, um, kale, uh, any of the brassicas like um, broccoli, you could start direct seeding. Um, probably, I would start those probably in about a week or so because the soil still is a little bit cool. In raised beds, they tend to warm up a little bit faster because the water drains out and waters what keeps the soil um, a little bit cooler um, early season. So those are some things that I can think of right off the top of my head. Is there any good way to warm up your soil in a raised bed? At black so, yeah, black fabric. <laughs> <laughs> Use that temporarily or even as a mulch permanently um, for like things like peppers. Peppers love growing in that kind of thing. Yeah, in that vein, let's talk a little bit about mulch. We've, we've had some questions come in about that as well, uh, specifically about choosing a good mulch for tomatoes, uh, but also, I guess, choosing a good mulch generally. What, what do you guys generally uh, weigh when you're picking how to mulch your beds or your garden in general? Yeah, um, for us, uh, even in our veggie garden at home, we use black fabric, um, like I said, because I just love not having to eat everything all the time. Um, and that does keep everything really warm. But then when it comes to all of our landscape beds, we're just using black cedar mulch, the natural mulch, not the dyed stuff that you would get in a bag. Um, make sure you know what's in your, in your mulch. Um, but yeah, I, I tend not to use things like straw and hay and things like that um, because of the weed seeds um, and just not really feeling like I know where they come from. So our go-tos are definitely uh, black mulch and black fabric. And, and it depends on the setting too, really. Um, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned those ones because those are really, really my top ones as well. Although I, I the, um, the cedar um, and bark mulch ones, I've, I've lear learned over the years to, to blend it with some compost too. I feel like that works pretty well. Um, yeah. You don't get that um, accumulation that you see, and especially in a lot of managed landscapes and um, commercial landscapes, you see like the trees that have the volcano mulch, um, where it's like right up against the trunk. And it's if you dig in there, you'll see that the, the mulch is like four, five, six inches deep. And there's roots growing up into that mulch, um, that those roots are more exposed to winter freezing and thawing. They're actually more susceptible, sounds counterintuitive, to um, drought in the summertime because they're, they're higher on the surface of the, um, more surface roots and they're not growing deeper. So um, making sure that you can blend in some compost with that bark mulch. And compost and uh, a dark bark mulch can look very similar to one another. So you think at the top of your head, how, do you, how would you blend those two? But you open up bags of, of two different products and a lot of times you, it's hard to tell the difference if you get a dark compost and a dark bark mulch. Um, so I like, I like that. Uh, we had a question come in about uh, growing vegetables next to each other and which ones are better uh, grown away from each other. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about companion planting and it's, I guess, uh, evil cousin, which I don't even know if it would have a name, but things that don't go well together. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about um, companion planting. And there's even books that, you know, talk about, you know, certain plants liking one another. And um, I feel like that intimidates a lot of gardeners more than it should. Um, so I would say one of the biggest things that I look at is size of a plant and making sure that you're accurately spacing your plants from one another and you're not planting a big, something that's going to be big, that looks really small when you go to plant it um, next to something that's gonna be lower stature. I think of like the square foot gardening method, you know, they, the spacing, if you look at planting a whole bed, um, and spacing them by the square foot gardening um, of a single type of plant. So cabbage, for example, that spacing makes sense if you have a single bed of cabbage. But if you try to plant cabbage or broccoli next to a square foot of carrots, 
those plants are going to get huge and then those carrots are going to get shaded out. So really it, it comes down to more the size of the final size of the plant than the actual type of plant and how well they behave next to each other. Yeah, and sometimes you can use things like that to your advantage. So if you know that you have a plant like broccoli that's going to come up and shade out beneath it, that might be a good place to stick some spinach, something that can is going to be low growing and can take a little bit of cool weather. Um, I agree, though, like I, I think a lot of people get intimidated by all of these ideas, like I can't plant the same thing here next year, or I have to plant this next to this. And it's really not absolutely necessary that you do that. I have clients who like, we have this bed that's in direct sun and that's the only bed we can plant those tomatoes in. And we're going to plant them there every year. We'll just make sure we treat our soil properly and, and compost it. I'm, and I'm glad you brought up tomatoes because that is, I mean, that seems to be the plant that everyone gets into gardening <laughs> through. Um, and so uh, tomatoes, they do come with their challenges, especially if you do have to plant it in the same spot every year. Um, they, they, there are a couple common diseases that are fungal diseases that you do want to watch out for. Um, and, and you may need to rotate them out into like maybe planters or buckets for two or three years if you've had signs of these diseases, or you can use other strategies like using mulch. Um, I think that's where you were going, Lacey, with that was the um, yeah. applying mulch to reduce the spore, the mm -hmm. Spores actually splashing up onto the lower leaves and working their way up the plant. I'm thinking of early blight being one of the biggest culprits of mm. tomato um, diseases. So um, what I do with our tomatoes typically is, even if there hasn't been a disease in, in the past in that area, is I plant the tomato, I put newspaper, um, Bangor Daily newspaper works really well. Um, around the especially if you subscribe. Exactly, especially if you subscribe. Um, and then, then you top that with either straw or compost. So you're, you know, you've already read the newspaper, so you don't need to read it again and you don't want it flying in your neighbor's mm -hmm. yard, but to anchor it down and to keep um, a good moisture barrier too. And that's a barrier between, again, if, if there's any spores in your, uh, fungal spores in your um, soil, from splashing up onto the plant during a rain event and then working its way up the plant. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about fungus. We had a question come in about that. Uh, how does fungus transmit? Is it just between leaves or uh, can it overwinter in the soil if it gets to the soil and how would that happen? How would it get into the soil? It depends on the, the, path, the um, pathogen. So it varies so much, but most of them, um, a lot of the don't overwinter in the soil um, and are come up um, on air currents, for example. Uh, there are a few like early blight and septoria are the two common ones for tomatoes. Um, so they do typically physically move up on the plant um, by having those spores splash um, up the plant, but you can also have it um, be transmitted through tools. Um, so you'll want to make sure that if you have had a disease um, plant disease in, in your landscape, um, making sure you have clean tools. But number one, the key is figuring out what the disease is in the first place and then um, figuring out how it behaves and how to um, not be part of that transmission process. Uh, we had a few past questions come in. Uh, one about uh, arugula. Uh, which I, I loved. Uh, I love arugula, but every time I try to grow it, it gets eaten almost overnight by little green worms. I think a pretty white butterfly with two dots on its wings lays their egg on the arugula. And after they hatch, I have nothing but stalks left. Do we have any thoughts about this pest? <laughs> Lazy, did you want to take that or do you want to? <laughs> yeah, it, I, I, this is the kind of question that I would reach out to the cooperative extension for if I did not know. So yeah. appropriate that Kate answers this one for you. I, I, it's hard to say from just feeding damage to say who the culprit is. Um, uh, so I, I would guess that a physical barrier such as row cover is going to be your best friend. Um, so anything that doesn't require pollination and you've had pressure, pest pressure in the past, um, I would suggest considering investing in row cover, also known as Agrabon or Rene. Um, I know I got it for Christmas one year. It was really a fun gift. Um, <laughs> you have a gardener in your life, birthday gift, Christmas gift. It's really handy. Um, Mother's Day is coming up. Mother's Day is coming up. Put it on your wish list. Um, but just some, some crops, you could just simply drape it over the plants 
Um, some crops you'll want to actually create a hoop um, using wire or I use PVC um, and just anchor that down into the soil and do that every four feet if you're doing it in rows and then drape it over that. And it's, it's a physical barrier that will prevent moths from coming in. Doesn't, it's not a sure bet against cutworms. Um, that's one that's kind of a trickier insect in the, in the gardening world, but a lot of them um, will be prevented in that using that tool. And so would, would row cover be a good way to prevent cabbage moth infestations as well? Yep, absolutely. Weeds love growing under row cover though. <laughs> so just make sure that you check under there regularly and weed. Um, and water will go right through the row cover, um, but it's a little bit easier to water deeply if you take the row cover off as well. So water and weed at the same time. <laughs> I just saw someone ask um, to spell the types of row covers. Um, so Agribon is, I honestly, I get it from Johnny Seeds. It's A-G-R-I-B-O-N um, or Reme, R-E-M-A-Y. Um, yeah, and Kate got it in there. Uh, but yeah, you guys can get that stuff from um, Johnny Seeds. They have it in any possible size. Um, and, and those guys, you know, they've, they've got all the tips and tools and techniques on their website to show you how to use it, how to put it up what plants need it and things like that. And another resource that I will plug for, for Johnny's is they have a great seed starting calculator that I really like it. Um, so if, I think I shared that with you, Sam, um, but for the follow-up email, um, but that you put in your frost-free date, which in our neck of the woods is um, around May 24th. And then it automatically calculates when you should be sowing seeds indoors and then when you can put them outdoors too, when you can safely put them outdoors, which I love. Obviously you wanna look at the weather right around that outdoor time um, because that can change significantly from year to year, um, but it's a great resource. I'm conscious of the fact that we are a little over time, but I wanted to squeeze in a question more too, if that's okay. Um, we had some questions come in about controlling invasive plants without herbicides. Uh, and I was wondering if you guys had any thoughts on that. The one specifically that we uh, were asked about was ajuga. Um, ajuga, ajuga loves to show up <laughs> in people's lawns. Um, Honestly, if you don't want to smother it out, um, which you could do by putting like a tarp or plastic, black, plastic, black fabric, something like that over it, a juga, if you just get in there and weed it out, it will come out. Um, but if you're, if you're trying not to use something against it and you also don't want to kill your lawn, that's really the best option. Um, you know, like a vinegar Epsom salt dish soap spray will will kill it on a nice hot sunny day because that vinegar will dehydrate the plant. Um, but then you're also probably killing your lawn. I'm assuming it's in this person's lawn. <laughs> it's, it is so persistent. I mean, I think you mentioned a black plastic and smothering it. It's kind of an ugly temporary solution, but um, it does it does help. Um, and, and if you have it along the margins, I mean, you can only cover and suppress it physically so far it's going to eventually creep back in. Um, so one of the things I find myself talking with uh, a lot of folks about is tolerance. <laughs> and um, you think about our, when our summers are um, hot and dry and our, our lawns go brown, those are the things that are still green or purplish. They flower, they're food source for pollinators. Um, Clover is a really great example of that. I had a great, I can't find the picture, but I took a picture last year of when it was um, just so droughty and the clover looked beautifully green. And then you had this really ugly brown turf. So think about <laughs> accepting some of those weeds as well. Changing yeah. our perspective. Awesome. And the last question I'm going to ask both of you is, uh, about garden planning. Uh, do you have any tips for planning either a cut flower garden or a vegetable garden? Any resources that you find helpful when you're planning your garden uh, or anything else you might wanna share on this? Yeah, um, I guess it's, for me, I think a lot of it is personal preference. You know, what kind of flowers you like and stuff like that. Um, but then again, like aesthetically, you know, 
a lot of mistakes that people make is, are like planting things too close to their house. You know, you put a lilac bush when you get it, it's three feet tall and you put it right next to your house. And that thing wants to be eight feet wide and would go through your window if you opened it. Um, so a lot of consideration into like the end size of things like that. Um, but really like using something like Pinterest and getting pictures of what you like uh, you may not even realize certain things that you're, you're kind of drawn to. Um, so picking out a, a style in general is a good idea. Um, you know, are you cottage style? Are you native? Do you like the, a lot of the like Asian, like rhododendrons and things like that? Um, and then I, I love books. Um, so I have a, a great book, Perennials for American Gardeners, I think it's called, that I just love to peruse through, like if I'm looking for a certain height or something like that. Um, but think of it a lot as like, like if you were to put a bunch of flowers in the vase, like which ones would you want to see next to each other? Which ones look good together? And then trying to kind of recreate something like that in your garden. Um, and then for veggie gardening, Kate. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love those those thoughts. And um, I think what to add to that would be um, take lots of pictures, really take as many pictures throughout the whole growing season from beginning to end, you won't regret it. And then, you know, with digital cameras, you can sort things by the month that they were taken and, um, and really get a good, um, literally a good snapshot of what what worked well and what did not work well in your landscape. And I, I personally, um, benefit most from visiting inspiring landscapes. So we are incredibly lucky in the state of Maine to be close to Maine Botanical Garden, but there's so many other public gardens that are even closer to home, like Ecotat and the Rogers Farm Demonstration Garden. And uh, on MDI, one of my favorites is Thuya Gardens um, and the Azalea Gardens. So um, make the time to get into those inspiring landscapes and, and just and, and again, take pictures and respect spacing. <laughs> I, I, I love that you pointed out that, that people oftentimes plant things that look small in inappropriate places and then they get way too big and, and you regret it. So same goes for vegetable gardens. Make sure that you look at um, the proper spacing and, and there are some great resources on our website for that. And there is a Victory Gardens um, uh, section, a 10 minute video or 15 minute video on planning your garden, that topic in particular in vegetable gardens. Yeah. And if you're a visual person, um, and if you've ever used Google maps, they have a satellite option that gives you that bird's eye view of your property. And that's such a great way to kind of see, help you kind of plan out like where you might like to walk through your yard, what your access points are, what existing big trees do you have and where can you create understory? Um, and, and yeah, like, like Kate said, just, just take pictures of what you like, get on Instagram and search the hashtag for the type of garden that you might like to find. And the same thing with Pinterest, um, just having those visual aids is, is really what will help inspire you and decide where you want to put things. Well, thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I hope you guys learned as much as I did. I feel like every time I have a conversation uh, with experts like Kate and Lacey, I walk away really just wanting to get my hands into the soil. Um, so thank you for coming and thank you to Lacey and Kate uh, for educating us all and answering our questions. Uh, Subscribe to the BDN, look out in your inbox for that follow-up email. I'll be sure to link as many resources as I possibly can in, and you can email me any additional questions you might have, and I can try to answer them or get Kate and Lacey to answer them, <laughs> depending on, on, on what the question is. So yeah. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kate and Lacey. This was fantastic. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alyssa and Sam.